run through fire. And he said, you're gonna have to. They've been on probation, they violated the probation. If pg and &E was an individual and not a corporation, I think by now they would be in prison. All new tonight at nine on Arizona PBS. Explore new ideas and new worlds here on Arizona PBS, a community service of Arizona State University. Join Emmy Award-winning NBC anchor Lester Holt as he receives the 2019 Walter Cronkite Award for Excellence in Journalism. Attracting industry leaders from the media, politics, business, and education, the award luncheon is the Cronkite School's signature event. Tickets for the luncheon ceremony on Monday, November 4th at the Sheraton in Phoenix are available for sale at cronkite.asu.edu slash luncheon or call 602-496-0482. Coming up next on Arizona PBS, life and world. Get the inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. Arizona PBS celebrates a moment in time made possible by Whitfield Nursery. Fort Defiance, established in 1851, was the first military post in Arizona. Once a symbol of control has become a place of hope for the Navajo who live there. Coming soon to Arizona PBS. Washington Week is an island of civil discourse in a chaotic media environment. On Friday night, we gather the best reporters in the nation and have a conversation that's about informing the American people. Washington Week. All new Friday night at 7 on Arizona PBS. Support for Arizona PBS comes from viewers like you and from... Hospice of the Valley, medical, social, and spiritual care for patients nearing end of life and support for their families. A not-for-profit community hospice, hob.org. AJ's Fine Foods, offering gourmet appetizers, fine wines for entertaining, and decadent desserts for all your special occasions. Find 10 Valley locations at ajsfinefoods.com. AJ's, purveyors of fine foods. From the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. Tonight on Cronkite News, how Arizonans are stepping into action to fight wildfires blazing through California. We bring you the latest from our Los Angeles Bureau. Plus, Arizona representatives on Capitol Hill are set to fight tomorrow over the future of mining around the Grand Canyon. We'll have their reactions to a proposed ban. <laughs> And play ball, we introduce you to a group of Arizona seniors taking home plate. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Marcella Bayetto. And I'm Jordan Elder. Thank you for joining us. With election year 2020 right around the corner, the Democratic debates promise to bring the heat. And what better location than the Valley of the Sun? Cronkite News reporter Frankie McClister spoke today with Phoenix Mayor Kate Gallego, who told us what she's doing to make sure Phoenix is on the list of possible debate locations. Frankie? Well, Mayor Kate Gallego says although the Democratic National Committee hasn't made any final decisions yet, they're taking a very hard look at the state of Arizona. I believe the Democratic nominee will have to win Maricopa County to move forward. The path to the presidency goes through Phoenix, and what better place to have a debate than this community? Which is exactly why Phoenix Mayor Kate Gallego is pitching the city of Phoenix as a potential site for one of the upcoming Democratic debates. I have asked the Democratic National Committee to host a presidential primary debate in the city of Phoenix. We are the fastest growing city in the country, and I think we're the perfect place to host a debate. Gallego says Phoenix is an innovative city and has the infrastructure to host an event like a democratic debate. She also says that the state's diverse population, including its tribal communities, makes it a necessary stop for those candidates. They feel like they've not been highlighted in presidential debates so far. 
what better state than Arizona to have a debate that talks about issues that matter to our tribal partners. Matt Grodsky, the director of communications for the Arizona Democratic Party, says he's excited about the idea of Phoenix potentially hosting a debate adding it'll be a busy year for his office. So we've had conversations with uh, Chairman Tom Perez, who's the chair of the DNC, um, and he said, hey, I, I love Arizona. He genuinely really appreciates the state, so the decision's really up to him. According to Gallego, the Democratic National Committee hosts debates in partnerships with television stations and news agencies. Depending on the issues debated, that can also factor in on choosing locations. We think with our growing innovative economy that we could really be a great place to have important discussions about policy issues that haven't been covered yet. Well, the next two Democratic primary debates are scheduled to take place both in California and in Georgia, but there are six additional ones scheduled for 2020. Locations for those are still to be determined. Right here in the studio, Frankie McWister, Cronkite News. Knowing who to vote for as an independent can be hard and confusing at times. That's why the Clean Elections Commission held the We the Voters Conference. It featured the political party perspective panel, bringing together leaders from all four of Arizona's major political parties. Cronkite News reporter Andrew Christensen was there as the discussions became a little heated. Leaders of the Republican, Democrat, Green and Libertarian parties gathered at the Phoenix Convention Center, starting the panel explaining what their parties stand for. Let people control their own retirement. Let them figure out how to retire for themselves. Replace government welfare with private charity and cut taxes and government spending. According to the Arizona Secretary of State website, libertarians make up less than 1% of voters. That's about the same as the Green Party. So if you value peace and if you value policies and candidates that want to address the climate crisis, without the outside influence of money and politics, then you're a green voter. The state's two main parties, the Republicans and Democrats, are fighting for the majority. As of July 1st, less than 2% divides those two, with Republicans holding a slight lead, and the two party leaders fought it out on stage as well. Another reason why people are gonna vote, because Donald Trump is manipulating the White House and has aligned himself with ISIS, and Saudi Arabia. I think I, I have to say that that, that is, is not true. But just let me say that the that most is, important yeah. thing that we can do today is vote for civility, vote for a president who's not going to align himself with the most dangerous foreign nations that are the reason why we uh, had 9-11. The president has not aligned himself with ISIS. That is a total and complete fabrication. With the, uh, I think for so another Despite arguments that may break out between parties, the Clean Elections Commission hopes to inform voters before they fill out their ballots. If you are an educated voter, if you're an informed voter, you know how to get your ballot. You understand the issues and the candidates that are on your ballot, and so you can feel confident in the choices that you're making. And so voter education is really critical to ensuring participation in our democracy. In Phoenix, Andrew Christensen, Cronkite News. The We the Voters conference also featured sessions on the upcoming primary, how the media influences elections, and how to have a civil conversation about politics. A school resource officer's use of pepper spray to stop a fight at Isaac Middle School has sparked controversy. The school resource officer is at Isaac Middle School broke up a fight with students in two incidents that have drawn criticism and support. Phoenix police say the officer used a pepper spray in the October 18th fight to break up more than 50 students. Seven days later, the officer handcuffed an 11 year old girl for 10 minutes. Police say in a statement that was to keep the situations from escalating. Some activist groups condemned the officer's actions while some parents support the officer. The officer is supposed to know how to de-escalate a situation, right? The police department is supposed to be getting training to de-escalate situations, uh, da much da very dangerous situations at times. Um, and so the fact that this officer didn't know how to de-escalate 11-year-olds fighting to me is extremely troublesome. We really are in favor for the officer to stay in school. We really need him. We have been seeing his work and he is working like really, really nice with the students. We haven't seen anything wrong. 
Isaac School District officials said in a statement they will conduct their own investigation. They were informed by Phoenix police that the officers actions were justified. Every year schools receive funding from the state based on enrollment. That funding is dispersed monthly to each Arizona school throughout the year. But what happens when those numbers are off? Schools can either get a big bill or a big check. Cronkite News reporter Isabella Holsizer looked at the adjustments and shows us how they balance the books. Some schools owe, some get a surplus, and some break even. Schools, schools all over around Arizona vary when it comes to the 2019 statewide recalculation adjustment. According to the 2019 adjustment, five schools owed the state upwards of a million dollars. That's not the case at Challenge Charter School in Glendale. Principal and CEO Wendy Miller says the system the state has in place can sometimes leave room for error in reporting. Uh, each individual school system has a student database information system and we feed those into the state system which is ever evolving. And so it can be difficult for vendors to keep up with some of the program or codes that are needed within the system to communicate. And so often what happens is a communication error that is resolved later. The resolution comes during the Arizona Department of Education's recalculation adjustment in August. Challenge Charter School was one of 119 schools that were right on target with the amount of students enrolled to the number in seats once school had started. You know, having a longevity of people in key positions, our compliance officer has been with us for almost 20 years. So between that and the consistent leadership, we understand some of those historical algorithms. 100 days into the school year, the state reviews funding that is sent to schools. The schools that were not on target end up on a repayment plan. If enrollment is lower than anticipated, the school repays the money back to the state little by little per month until the debt is fully paid off. The same situation happens in reverse. When schools see higher enrollment than expected, the state adds a surplus of funding each month until the schools are awarded the correct amount. Typically, 75% of what a school owes is paid back within the first year. But what about the schools that owe a million dollars or more? Santan Montessori School owes the state $6.7 million. As would any other school that owes money back to the state, they are being put on a payment plan. Schools have the opportunity to pay it back over the course of two years should they elect to. So they have to fill out a form and apply for that option, but that is a completely viable option for them. The Santan Montessori School has not yet responded to our request for comment. The average amount that schools are given per student varies among Arizona schools. At Challenge Charter School, it is around six to $9,000 per student. This amount can fluctuate based on factors like special education students and other outside funding. In the Broadcast Center, Isabella Holsizer, Cronkite News. Today is a big day for the future of college sports, opening the door to college athletes making money while still competing. Cronkite News reporter Brady Klein joins us from the media center to explain how student athletes could now earn a piece of the very large college sports financial pie. For years, a major debate within the NCAA is whether or not athletes and players should be able to profit and make money off their image and their likeness. Well, today, a major step forward was for the athletes. The NCAA announced Tuesday morning that the Board of Governors has started a process that will allow student athletes to profit off of their name, image, and likeness. Arizona State head football coach Herm Edwards took to the podium to discuss what this means for NCAA athletes. Whatever you do in sports at any level, if, it's, if, it, if it helps the sport, then you need to do it. But I don't know what all the rules are. I don't. I have no idea. I, I, and I'm not going to sit here and say I do, um, but whatever it does, as long as it's, it helps the sport and everybody can benefit from it, and, and you do the right thing for the sport. While it may be the right thing to do in Edwards' eyes, Nathan Coleman lamb a professor at Duke University studying social inequality in sports, believes it is also the easiest thing for the NCAA to do. Right? Like we know that fans love college sports as they currently exist. We know that it's producing billions of dollars. So why would the NCAA risk jeopardizing what they have basically a perfect model as it is, right? And this allows them to 100% preserve that commodity spectacle exactly as it is, preserve the so-called competitive playing field, fairness, et cetera, right? And again, the NCAA and its member institutions are not on the hook for footing the bill. 
The Board of Governors directed each of the NCAA's three divisions to immediately work to update bylaws and policies. The move follows the recommendations of an NCAA working group that includes Northern Arizona President Rita Chang. In the Media Center, Brady Klain, Cronkite News. After the break, wildfires continue to wreak havoc all throughout California. We'll bring you the latest as well as what Arizona fire crews are doing to help out. And gathering natural resources from protected lands is a common debate among lawmakers. We'll show you how the latest fight among representatives could impact the future of the Grand Canyon. Join Emmy Award winning NBC anchor Lester Holt as he receives the 2019 Walter Cronkite Award for Excellence in Journalism. Attracting industry leaders from the media, politics, business and education, the award luncheon is the Cronkite School's signature event. Tickets for the luncheon ceremony on Monday, November 4th at the Sheraton in Phoenix are available for sale at cronkite.asu.edu slash luncheon or call 602-496-0482. Then I stumbled across the kids' programs and I fell in love with Arthur. I, mean, I used to be a school teacher. Some of my classes I taught were K through six. I liked Arthur's approach to how you would teach a moral or how to teach a way to react to a situation. And they always had a moral of the story. So I s still watch Arthur quite religiously. For more information about including Arizona PBS in your future plans, visit azpbs.org giving. I want to say is that my heart goes out to, to people in California. To have 200,000 people and likely more displaced uh, to these wildfires, uh, I can't imagine. So Arizona wants to step up and be helpful in any way that we can. And Arizona is stepping up. More than 120 firefighters and 34 engines are there now, according to the Arizona Department of Forestry and Wildfire Management. Cronkite News reporter Kirsten Corns has the latest on the wildfires and joins us live from our Los Angeles Bureau. Behind me you'll see clear blue skies, but that wasn't the case 24 hours ago when the Getty fire broke out. Now firefighters all over the west are working to control flames that are roaring through dry vegetation and rugged terrains fueled by extreme winds. Fire season is in full effect in California. There have been fires flaring up throughout LA County, with the most recent blaze being the Getty Fire. The fire broke out around 1.30 a.m. Monday morning, and while the cause remains unknown, at least 656 acres have burned and eight structures have been destroyed. With the help of neighboring city and state fire crews, the Getty Fire is 5% contained, but more than 7,000 homes are currently under mandatory evacuation. We're staffing additional resources, so we've augmented our staffing by bringing in crews that would normally be off, uh, hiring them behind the resources that are already here. Arizona firefighting crews are hard at work fighting fires elsewhere in the state, as firefighters from all over the West scramble to protect homes up and down the California coast. In Northern California, over 70,000 acres have burned in wine country. Our goal is to get out as many of those hot spots and within the fire perimeter as possible. So that's why you'll see so many firefighters here on the ground getting out those hot spots. Currently, Santa Ana winds are blowing at 60 miles per hour in the Los Angeles area, fanning flames and making the fire behave unpredictably. Those winds are expected to last through the 31st. And that ash will travel up to a mile on the ridgetops because of the wind and those Santa Ana winds that are going 60 miles an hour, and it can ignite a spot fire. With winds expected to pick up again tonight at 11 p.m., firefighters are expecting to work through the night. In Los Angeles, Kirsten Corns, Cronkite News. September is usually a slow month for Phoenix Sky Harbor International Airport, but a new report shows it was the airport's busiest September in history. According to the report released by the city's aviation department, over 3 million passengers came through Sky Harbor, a 6.5% increase from last September. Delta and American Airlines reported the largest jumps in passengers among the airport's major carriers. July through November tends to be slower months for Sky Harbor. Total passenger numbers tick back up around the holiday season and Phoenix's tourism season, which begins in January. Governor Doug Ducey spoke today about the impact of manufacturing jobs in Arizona, highlighting it's one of the largest industries creating employment in the state. Cronkite News reporter Jenna Yanoni was there and has the details on what else the governor said. Jenna? 
Governor Ducey spoke at Ping headquarters today in Phoenix, where he talked about how manufacturing jobs are actually starting to outpace construction jobs here in Arizona. Governor Doug Ducey says that the opportunities in manufacturing bring attention, money, and jobs to Arizona. Believe it or not, in Arizona today, we have more manufacturing jobs than we do construction jobs. 179,800 uh, manufacturing jobs, 174,000 uh, construction jobs. So I think a, a lot of that is the economy, a lot of that is the opportunity. The governor also says that the manufacturing industry is diverse, making jobs accessible for all skill sets. I want to have an economy that uh, provides opportunity for all, that doesn't uh, discriminate from the service sector to the software sector. And that's what we've been able to see in Arizona. Governor Ducey says that the technology in the industry is advancing in a way that might scare some, although he only thinks that this will bring more job opportunities. From the Broadcast Center, I'm Jenny Anoni for Cronkite News. Coming up, I'll tell you whether we should be experiencing some chilly temperatures on Halloween. With wildfires, a scarcity of water, and other environmental issues facing the Earth today, it's critical to stay up to date with local impacts of a changing climate. That's why we created Elemental Covering Sustainability, a multimedia collaboration between public television and radio stations. From climate change to water conservation to renewable energy and much more, Elemental covers the latest in sustainability news. Find our stories on our website, elementalreports.com. The House began debate today on the Grand Canyon Centennial Protection Act, a bill that would ban mining on just over 1 million acres of federal land surrounding the national park. Opinions are sharply divided in the House, just as they are for some Arizona lawmakers. So the, the bottom line here is that it's a plus to save the groundwater of the Grand Canyon, to save the Grand Canyon's uh, unique ecosystem, and to be able to uh, cre create and, and continue to have a tourism industry that brings in almost a billion dollars a year to northern Arizona. If we're really about the health and, and well-being of people downwater and in the canyon like the Havasupai and the Wallapai, we ought to be taking these breach of pipes out and conveying so that clean water is coming down into the aquifers so that we don't have that constant barrage of low levels of, of uh, uh, radioactivity. The bill has 100 and in 21 co-sponsors, including all the Arizona Democrats in the House, a final vote on the bill is expected tomorrow. And it's been pretty chilly in Phoenix. I can only imagine how cold it's been up in the Grand Canyon. Yeah, it's probably colder up there, huh? Yeah, we're actually experiencing uh, chilly temperatures throughout the whole week, and we're, we're even going to have a chilly Halloween. But before <laughs> oh, that, no. let me tell you about our Tuesday. So let's go to the weather. Okay, as you guys are getting off work, temperatures are going to be sitting about 72 degrees right now. And as you can see, it's only going to get chillier as the night moves on. We're going to move to 68 around 7 p.m., then tail off around 62 around 9 o'clock tonight. Let's see what those valley highs are looking like tomorrow. It's not going to be that high this time of year. Average temperature is 83 degrees, and we're going to be way below that. 70 in Tempe, 70 in Phoenix, 67 in Whit uh, Whitman, and that's it. And then let's see our Halloween forecast on Thursday. Let's take a sneak peek. It's going to be chilly on Halloween, 75 on it's going to be 75 at 5 p.m. and move to 65 around 9 o'clock. Let's see our seven-day forecast. It's going to be 70 on Wednesday, 76 on Thursday. And then let's see how our weekend's looking like. Sunny, 85, 82. That's it for me, Miller Thomas from the Cronkite News Weather Center. Now don't go away. We've got more coming up on Cronkite News. How a local senior community is putting their best foot forward on the field. That's next. Join Emmy Award-winning NBC anchor Lester Holt as he receives the 2019 Walter Cronkite Award for Excellence in Journalism. Attracting industry leaders from the media, politics, business, and education, the award luncheon is the Cronkite School's signature event. Tickets for the luncheon ceremony on Monday, November 4th at the Sheraton in Phoenix are available for sale at cronkite.asu.edu slash luncheon or call 602-496-0482. 
I'm Judy Woodruff, anchor and managing editor of the PBS NewsHour. The journalists of tomorrow face a fast-changing media landscape, but quality news remains vitally important to our communities, our country, and our world. At ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication, students learn solid, reliable reporting, holding the powerful accountable, and rebuilding the public's trust. The Cronkite School and Arizona PBS preparing the next generation for a stronger future of journalism. As journalists at Cronkite News, we report on stories that matter to you by focusing on the local impact. We dig deeper and work tirelessly to keep you informed. Live in Wickerburg. Live in Los Angeles. In Cleveland. In Washington. In Louisville. From Jerusalem. Live in Philadelphia. From around the world to right here in Phoenix. At Cronkite News, we report the facts and stick to the truth. On the next Arizona Horizon, key players in the state's electric vehicle marketplace get together to move the industry forward, and researchers look at the troubling increase of plastics being found in seafood. I'm Judy Woodruff. Tonight on the News Hour, I talk with Vice President Pence about the killing of ISIS leader and the impeachment of the president. Coming up after Cronkite News and Arizona Horizon on Arizona PBS. An active senior lifestyle can add five years to your life, and a local senior community in Goodyear is keeping active in an annual softball league. Reporter Madison Carter joins us in the studio. Madison, what makes this league one of a kind? Yes, well, the Pebble Creek Senior Softball Association opened its annual softball league this month, marking the league's 25-year anniversary. This 15-team co-ed league only expects to keep growing and playing. The start to a new season is underway for the Pebble Creek Senior Softball Association. 180 residents in the Ropes and Resort community participate in the league. It's a lot of fun to come out. The guys are great. The league is wonderful. I'm vice president this year, so it's fun to be on the board and be a kid again. <laughs> the seniors play three games a week with practice days in between. And with all of the action, it's easy to forge friendships with one another. It's, it's the camaraderie of the whole thing. It's just that friendship that you establish. It's like a, it's like a bunch of brothers, you know, you just come out and have fun. It's one of the, the most enjoyable things about this league is that uh, everybody out here and everybody on the field, uh, you know. Since the Pebble Creek Senior Softball Association has been around for now 25 years, the association has grown in many ways, including changes to the field and the addition of new teams in the league. One of the big things is the field. The field is much better because when we started, we started on a little league field. Every year, uh, it seems like we, we, have, we have more and more teams, and this year we have 15 teams, uh, and we, we have improvements to the field. We have uh, a new scoreboard this year, new fencing, some new sod in the, in the outfield. With some of the players participating for many of the 25 years the league has been around, they already know what teams are the ones to beat this season. Questar. <laughs> I know they won last year, uh, the, the league championship. They've got a great team, great bunch of guys. Oh, well, Osborne Jewelers. We're the team to beat, absolutely. My team. <laughs> the league lets it be known that the games are just friendly competition. And although some do come to win, for others, the fact that they just get to play is all that matters. I'm here to play. I don't care whether I win or lose. I just, just want to play. I mean, how many people at 80 years old get a chance to play softball? Not very many. The teams play every Tuesday and Thursday, and they will play 38 games total this season. That's such an adorable story. What was it like, the atmosphere over there with all of them? The atmosphere was amazing. <laughs> I mean, the energy was just up, over the roof, and everyone just loved being there. Everyone, the crowd was going crazy, and it was just an awesome experience just to be there and be a part of it. Who did they bring to watch them, their families? The families were there. The, all the players were there. Everyone was just Aww. waiting, so... Oh, I love that. <laughs> well, that's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thanks for joining us. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org. And be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Cronkite News for the latest stories right at your fingertips. Arizona Horizon is next. Have a good night.
by noon, we had conceded that the town had basically burned down. And I told my husband, I'm like, I can't run through fire. And he said, you're going to have to. They've been on probation. They violated the probation. If PG&E was an individual and not a corporation, I think by now they would be in prison. All new tonight at 9 on Arizona PBS. Explore new ideas and new worlds here.